The following is a keynote speaker presentation from the ACM 97 conference, The Next 50 Years of Computing. ACM 97 brought together over 2,000 leaders and luminaries from all aspects of the computing world to discuss and predict what the next 50 years of computing has in store. ACM 97 underwriters were Computer World, Hewlett Packard, Intel, Microsoft, and Sun Microsystems. Sponsors were Cadmus Journal Services, IBM, Netscape, Popular Science, Sheridan Printing Company Incorporated, Silicon Graphics Incorporated, SoftBank, and Unisys. The event also included a major exposition with a paleotechnic look back to the future from the year 2047 and a specially commissioned book, Beyond Calculation, featuring essays on the next 50 years of computing by luminaries and pioneers in the field. The ACM 97 conference was chaired by Robert Metcalf and emceed by James Burke. Details on how to obtain more information on ACM 97 follow this program. Ladies and gentlemen, James Burke. The first speaker in this session is, I suppose, uh, somebody you could describe as a mover and shaker because of what he does and where he does it. He started out with a doctorate in nuclear physics from Yale in 65. Then he spent 15 years at IBM's research lab in Yorktown Heights um, and became director of computer sciences. In 1980, he joined the company he's been with since Hewlett Packard as the founding director of their computer research center in Palo Alto, just up the street. Now, along the way, he's also been vice president and general manager of the Information Technology Group and vice president and director of Hewlett Packard Labs. Today, he's the company's senior vice president of R&D. He's a board member of the Corporation for National Research Initiatives and the Technion University of Israel, and he serves on the advisory boards of Cornell, Stanford, Carnegie Mellon, USC, and the Singapore National Science and Technology Board. As you can see, a lot of people think he knows what he's talking about. Throughout his career, his personal research contributions have been and continue to be in distributed systems, real-time data acquisition, analysis and control, and risk processor architecture in which he was one of the early and real pioneers. You could say that his job today is all about what this conference is all about, thinking about and making decisions based on the alternate directions in which the computer industry could or should go, decisions on which in his case and that of his company a great deal rides, to put it mildly. So not surprisingly this morning, the title of his talk is alternatives, the different kinds of computing that lie ahead over the next 50 years, the possible, what you might describe as winners and losers, and the kinds of things that we're likely to be using them for. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Joel Birnbaum. I think uh, it should be obvious to everybody here that's thought about it that you shouldn't really expect technologists to be very good when they pretend to be Jules Verne or Leonardo da Vinci or H.G. Wells. Um, we haven't been very good predictors of the future, and if technologists aren't good about it, what should you expect from a manager of technology? Because after all, what we do is we try to understand the needs of users today, apply some imagination to them, and uh, then uh, see whether or not our current technologies can be extrapolated forward to cover that need, or if not, whether we can produce some variation on it. So if we're lucky, as you've heard and, uh, very eloquently from uh, Gordon, we can perhaps look ahead 10 years, maybe 15 years, um, but certainly 50 years is far too long to use an extrapolation technique, and I think that's why the science fiction writers are so much better at this, because they think of what they'd like the world to be like and not how to um, move technology incrementally to keep the profits up. Nevertheless, um, I enter this talk with a great deal of uh, hope and optimism for the future, 
So this will be an optimistic message. Uh, that's a trait that I've developed in, by working in big companies. But it's also because I've noticed that as technology marches along, what we often see is a kind of a replacement phenomenon, uh, what I think of as an Xless Y. So this means that um, when cars came along, you could think of them for a while as a horseless carriage, as a carriage without the horse. Uh, we have had uh, wireless telephones and so forth. And so one of the questions that I'll try to address as we go along is what's the X and what's the I in that interaction between computers and humans 50 years from now? So in fact, what I'm going to look at are alternatives to electronic stored program computing, as we've practiced it for 50 years, uh, that have disruptive potential. And I use that word to mean a technology which has uh, so many advantages that it displaces the technology which came before it, as the IC did to the um, vacuum tube, as, the, um, as many other technologies that we've come to take for granted, like the electronic calculator displacing the slide rule, have just been so much superior that they have uh, obviated what came before. Instead of doing this in my imagination, I've chosen uh, three, could have chosen a, a larger number, uh, that are already the subject of worldwide research. I'm going to try to explain how they work, what their advantages might be, what some of the shortcomings are. I'll say in advance that uh, I'll have to do this very quickly and somewhat superficially, and so I'll apologize for that. I'm just trying to get the idea across. And then I'm going to uh, follow the lead of uh, other speakers and throw caution to the winds, uh, shred whatever remains of credibility by that time, and uh, predict uh, what we might do with this kind of uh, computing power were it to become available. There's uh, some solace in doing this in knowing that when that time capsule is open 50 years from now, I probably won't have to be there to um, look at the predictions. Uh, I do agree, though, that in order to look forward to the next century, it's a good idea first to look back and see how far we've come. ENIAC, the starting point for last year's 50th anniversary meeting, was arguably the first digital stored program electronic computer. Also, it was the most powerful computer on Earth for nine years. I'm going to cover these three uh, alternatives today. Quantum computing, which you've already heard something about from uh, Carver, DNA-based computing, and optical uh, computing. And then moving forward from that, I'm going to now come back to what I said about the ENIAC. Here are some of the uh, early pictures. And uh, you can notice one interesting thing, that uh, a, a profession, unfortunately, was eliminated by the integrated circuit because one of the things these people are doing is transferring intermediate results manually from accumulator to accumulator in this machine. Let's look at some of the vital statistics for the uh, ENIAC. It had 19,000 vacuum tubes, 1,500 relays, weighed 60,000 pounds. It filled 16,200 cubic feet and it needed 174 kilowatts of power. And it could add the then unthinkable number, 5,000 numbers per second. So Popular Mechanics, in its March 1949 edition, assembled a panel of experts. And they asked people to project into the future of the ENIAC. And they indeed did some bold things. They suggested that it might have only 1,500 vacuum tubes, about a factor of 10 improvement, weigh only one and a half tons, but still be as powerful as the ENIAC. As with most of these kinds of predictions, the error was shocking. Um, instead of making a machine the size of a sports car and with energy consumption to match, um, we, of course, have machines like this. This is the latest HP uh, Palm Top, weighs seven ounces, runs for several months on two AA batteries. It can execute millions of instructions per cycle. So one lesson that I think we should learn about the future is that we must not be too shy about our predictions. We have to understand how and why we made the progress we have. But as others uh, have said before me, uh, we must be sure that anything we propose obeys the laws of physics, conservation of energy, thermodynamics, relativity, and so forth. But I think that there's a second and much more important reason uh, to keep in mind. And that is, the reason that these predictions seem so point to us today is not that the people were stupid. In fact, if we were still building uh, machines from vacuum tubes, they might not be too far off. But in fact, a disruptive technology, the integrated circuit, came into play. And so that changed everything. Furthermore, because we live in these times, 
with the web and the internet, guaranteeing that scientific results will be propagated almost instantaneously throughout the world, I think we will see an enormous speed up in the sharing of knowledge and that the progress will be even faster. Consider, for example, if the Egyptians, while planning the pyramids, had suddenly gotten a web message telling them about the wheel. What might we have today? So um, I'm going to start, as others have, with the keeping the ground rules of conserving physical law in place. Take a look at a slide, which um, is uh, yet another depiction of the um, Moore's Law. Uh, and as one estimate of what could be in store for computing in 2047, let's not pay attention to Gordon's notion about the folly of such extrapolations, although I certainly agree with him, and just say that somehow, we don't know how, let's imagine that we can keep this exponential growing. What would we have? So the memory and processor would um, probably be able to hold about 2 times 10 to the 16th bits of data. Uh, that's roughly speaking the storage capacity of 100,000 brains. A single data processor would have the uh, processing capability of several million uh, Pentium Pros. Memory and processor would have to fit into about one cubic centimeter to follow the um, constant uh, maximum speed of light law. And that means that it would be about the size of a sugar cube, and it would probably about be about equal in power to um, a great fraction of the computers that have ever been built to this point. Well, this seems fantastic and silly, but it doesn't violate any physical laws. And no matter how improbable it is, it seems to be possible that clever engineers will do the same thing here as they did with the barriers for optical lithography and figure out how to do this. What could you do with it if you could do it? Well, one device of this sort, one nanoprocessor, could do a real-time simulation of the entire Earth's weather with a resolution of about 50 meters. That's pretty good, uh, but it's not good enough to really test the idea that a butterfly flapping its wings in China might really cause a hurricane in the Gulf of Mexico. Following Moore's law, we'd have to wait another 15 years before we could do that calculation. But before we get carried away with the extrapolation of Moore's law, it's important to say that the engine that brought us to this point, CMOS, can only get us part of the way there. The Semiconductor Industry Association has laid out a uh, map that sets as a goal a continuation through 2010. And part of the reason that they chose that date is that by then, all of the individual transistors in the circuits will be turned on and off by only eight electrons impinging on the gate, as opposed to the roughly 1,000 that do it in today's technology. So sometime after 2010, certainly before 2020, we're going to run into our first real physical limitation, which is less than an electron appearing uh, at the gate. Electrons today, transistors, follow the rules of classical mechanics, and um, so what we have gotten used to, the statistical action of electrons, will no longer hold. In spite of this, a lot of researchers have blind optimism that this is just going to happen. Uh, uh, maybe. But I'd like to consider instead the first alternative approach to improving the capability of electronic circuits, so-called quantum computing. Now, I do this with a fair trepidation, and a, a short story may make you see why. Um, there was once a gentleman who had survived the great Johnstown flood, and for the remainder of his life, he achieved some local celebrity by telling everybody about the resourcefulness that enabled him to do it. And so when he finally got to heaven and was asked uh, as a first day visitor what it is that he would like to welcome him, he said, well, I really would like it if you'd assemble all the people so I could tell them about how I survived the Johnston flood. Uh, St. Peter said, fine, but please remember that Noah will be in the audience. Uh, well, I'm going to talk to you about quantum mechanics while one of my heroes, uh, Murray Gell-Mann, may be in the audience. Um, it's a little scary. Uh, but the basis of quantum computing certainly lies in the behavior of electrons when we constrain them to dimensions of nanometers at room temperature. Because in that situation, instead of behaving like classical particles, they behave as if they're waves. We're very comfortable with classical mechanics because we've interacted with the macroscopic classical world during essentially all of our evolutionary journey to the present. But when we enter the domain of the very, very small, the laws of quantum mechanics rule the behavior of matter, and the laws of quantum mechanics 
do not seem to conform to our notions of common sense, which is gained by our experience with the macroscopic classical world. The mathematical constructs, which form the basis of much of our understanding of how matter behaves at the atomic and subatomic levels, are very hard to explain in words. Quantum behavior, though, essentially limits the kinds of things that a device designed for classical operation can achieve. But, as you've heard from Carver, it also provides tremendous opportunities for the operation of entirely new kinds of devices. One way to think about this is if we think of uh, the electrons as being characterized by waves, waves can um, exhibit interference phenomena, where waves that pass through two openings or travel down two or more wires interfere with themselves. This interference could be the basis for new types of devices. At the present time, because we still are making them with micron length scales, we have to cool them in order to see these effects. But when we learn how to make nano devices that operate at room temperature, the quantum effects will be clearly visible. How could you use them? Well, one of the things you can do with waves is create a device called an interferometer in which we um, send waves along two different paths that intersect each other at some region of space. We can consider that to be a gate, and that means that if we launch a wave into the interferometer, it'll split up, part of the wave going on one branch, the other part going on another, and when, they, uh, meet it, when the wave meets itself again, uh, where the paths intersect, the two pieces may be in phase, in which case it will grow larger, or they may be out of phase, in which case the amplitude will be uh, small. By changing the length of one of the arms of the waveguide, you can change the phase with which the, the um, pieces of the wave interfere, and so you can switch the amplitude of the wave, and that means, of course, that you can build uh, a binary uh, Boolean device. Uh, you can do binary logic and from that build binary devices. But one major obstacle that these devices are going to face is how to wire them all together. Uh, one uh, potential solution to this problem is to use device architectures that do not need any, or at least need very little wiring. Example of these are many types of uh, quantum cellular automata that have been proposed. These devices work by passing information, usually in the form of a single electron, uh, from one cell to the neighboring cells. And we have examples of this style of device, charge couple devices, shift registers, and so forth. But of course, these cannot compete with CMOS for their high-end computing and storage applications. But if the cells became small enough that there are many billions of them per square centimeter, then the sheer numbers and the speeds with which they can change information uh, could make them very attractive. So the next slide shows an array of such structures, which have been called quantum dots. And these are, were made at HP Labs. And these tiny islands of germanium on a silicon substrate are only 15 nanometers high, and they have a deviation of only one nanometer. Uh, they can trap a single electron in each of the so-called quantum dots. And a major benefit, then, is that this can be constructed by chemical self-assembly, a uh, very, very inexpensive um, manufacturing procedure and one of the possible ways around Moore's second law, which has to do with the cost of the facilities as a function of the density of the devices that are being constructed. So far, we've only considered performing computations with traditional Boolean logic. All present computers are based on this. But quantum devices, as you've heard, provide the theoretical possibility of a new type of logic, so-called quantum logic, using quantum bits or qubits. It depends on the paradoxical property of a quantum system which is known as superposition. Superposition means that sometimes the gate in a quantum logic system is in the true state, sometimes it's in the false state, but most of the time it's somewhere in between, a kind of a very small scale schizophrenia. This state can be described as a nearly infinite number of possibilities. In um, principle, this peculiar characteristic can be exploited. And it means that we can introduce extraordinary parallelism in certain types of computation. A gate can uh, only be true or false in Boolean logic, but in quantum logic, it can have a great many possibilities. Classical computations proceed by performing Boolean operations one after another in series. Quantum logic lets you take a huge set of numbers and do all these almost simultaneously. Thus, in principle, with quantum logic, you can use one circuit simultaneously to compute with many numbers. In fact, the number of bits in the calculation 
goes is 2 to the n, where n is the number of quantum gates in the system. So therefore, if you could build a quantum computer, for example, with 800 gates, it would be able to do simultaneous calculation on more numbers than there are protons in the known universe. And even a small quantum computer could take on problems of exponential complexity that we can't uh, even attack today. Again, as you've heard, uh, computer scientists have long measured the efficiency of an algorithm uh, in computer complexity, computing complexity time. And uh, we know that uh, so-called NP problems are intractable uh, on conventional machines once the number n becomes uh, large enough. So if we could find algorithms which would lend themselves to this type of quantum computing, and if we could build the quantum computers, then in fact we might hope for a vast exponential increase in simultaneous computing and in the type of problems we could attack. The first and pioneering work in this was done by uh, Peter Shore at Princeton a few years ago. And perhaps this uh, example will give you a feeling for how this might operate. For example, considering, consider factoring a 100-digit decimal number. Even with the kind of computer that we postulate would come from the extrapolation of Moore's law into the year 2047, it still requires, if you follow through that arithmetic, uh, on a, a 10 to the 10th divisions per second machine, that we would um, need 10 to the 40th seconds to factor a 100 decimal uh, digit number using a trial division method. When you consider that the age of the universe is only 10 to the 17th seconds, this uh, seems a long time to wait, even for patient industrial managers. So um, that's why the encryption codes, of course, use large numbers. And that's why they're considered so secure. But now, uh, suddenly, a quantum computer could, in theory, factor such a number in about one minute. Although, as we'll see, this requires overcoming enormous obstacles. But they don't appear to be fundamental obstacles. They appear to just be extraordinarily difficult uh, uh, engineering solutions that are going to be required and some understanding of how we can overcome uh, the behavior of a single quantum state when it is part of an ecosystem, as you've heard, which uh, it is coupled to and which is distorted, becomes decoherent, uh, when in fact uh, we make a measurement by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So all of this is very nice in principle, but how can we make it work? Issues of basic physics, many proposals, uh, but hard problems. How do you get the information in and out without disturbing the state of the systems? Uh, how do you actually build such a device? How could the power for such incredibly dense devices be reduced to practical levels? Do we need uh, reversible logic, for example? Uh, how can programming be done? How can you deal with the unavoidable errors in systems which have such vast numbers of devices? Can you service such a machine? Many more daunting problems. I doubt very much that any one group or any one idea is going to solve this problem. But with the flow of information in the world today, I think that there are so many questions that so many uh, clever people are working on that over the years, I think we'll find some solutions either from a combination of these things or maybe from a brand new idea that nobody else has thought of yet. Another problem is finding the kinds of algorithms which will let us take advantage of this exponential pro uh, property. And yet another is what kind of problems could it attack? Obviously, it could be used to simulate quantum mechanical systems. It could do Fourier transforms, which would help tremendously in pattern recognition and might, in fact, enable the kind of perception-based uh, computation that uh, Carver referred to. It also has, in principle, again, uh, an inherent property that makes it ideal for searching huge databases. Let's say you wanted to search the entire Library of Congress to find an obscure quotation from a single book. Well, classical computers would have to take that phrase and compare it serially to all the phrases in the library. Of course, a quantum computer uh, through the superposition and spectral pattern matching would be able to do it in a single pass, although retrieving information will not be simple. There are about 30 groups in the world working on trying to build fast Boole Boolean logic conventional computer, but using these kind of devices. By far the most uh, people are in Japan. Uh, there are at least seven, maybe 10 theoretical suggestions about how to build such devices. A single electron transistor is one of those. 
but the vast majority of work here is theoretical. There are um, several experimental demonstrations of the simplest unit of a quantum computer, which uh, is the existence proof that we can do it, but the enormous complexities of trying to uh, deal with this are before us. Well, now I'd like to turn to something completely different. Let's talk about the second alternative, DNA-based computing. In November 1994, Dr. Leonard Adelman, who won an award last night and who may be in this audience, uh, of the University of Southern California, startled the computer science world with a paper dealing how he had used 100 microliters of DNA molecules, that's about 1 50th of a teaspoon, to solve a simpler uh, variation of the classic traveling salesman's problem. Since then, um, many other researchers have taken up the cause, and now a number of them believe that DNA-based computing might solve some problems intractable on today's or tomorrow's most powerful supercomputers, again through massive parallelism and exponential speed-up, and so again, interesting for the same reason that the quantum computers are interesting. Remember that uh, while conventional computers represent data in binary digits, these first DNA-based computers use strings of DNA base pairs. They perform their calculations by carrying out common biochemical manipulations, combining, copying, extracting the strands of DNA. In other words, you synthesize particular sequences of DNA using ordinary techniques, let them react in a test tube, and then you examine the results. The problem that uh, Dr. Adelman approached was the one in which he considered, in this example, seven nodes, say, representing cities, and uh, asked the uh, classic question whether starting in one node and ending in another, there existed a path between the two that entered each node along the way uh, once and only once. He solved the problem by creating short DNA pairs to represent each city and the route between them, and he first designed the molecules so that they would randomly join and thus would test all of the possible solutions. And that's the important uh, part to remember at this. Let's look at it in more detail. On the next series of slides, to the left at the top, I've shown the mathematical manipulation, and to the right uh, is the biochemical and molecular biological one, which um, fortunately I don't have the time to try to explain. Uh, but in step one, what we do, or what he did, was to generate random paths through the grass. He does this by randomly connecting or ligating together the pieces of DNA, which he had previously constructed in unique sequences to represent the uh, seven equal length chains that represent each city. The result after this operation are uh, chains of different lengths, uh, and they represent all of the possible paths among the cities. In step two, we use another um, biochemical manipulation, the so-called polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, uh, to, uh, to select only those chains which, uh, are, which start at node zero and end at vertex six. In step three, we use a, a different procedure known uh, in the trade as PAGE, which is a type of gel electrophoresis operation, and that means that, and what it does is to select only those paths that enter exactly seven vertices. And then, of course, in step four, we keep only the paths that entered all seven of the vertices at least once. So having done this, we then amplify the result. And if there's something less, our answer to the question is, yes, there is a path. And then by doing uh, sequencing, we can figure out the correct solution. Now, of course, this is, as n gets large, uh, an NP problem. And what this says is that while the individual steps of the biological computer, this, this took a week, for example, for just seven nodes, are very, very slow compared to electronic speeds, the uh, speed up is enormous. Uh, and there are other advantages besides. A biological computer is a billion times more energy efficient, and it stores information potentially in just one trillionth of the space of conventional electronics. But more important is the parallelism. A DNA computer can have unimaginably many molecules performing this type of calculation simultaneously. So instead of the few thousand or tens of thousands of independent processors in massively parallel electronic computing, according to um, Professor Richard Lipton of Princeton, uh, 
a test tube could easily hold 10 to the 18th DNA strands, which gives it the theoretical capability of performing 1 billion billion operations at once. So it's very well suited to perform this sort of massive computations, such as breaking a government's data encryption codes. It may take weeks or months to reach the solution, but the problem may not otherwise be tractable. So we could solve many interesting and important types of combinatorial problems in practice. And this could also turn out to be an extraordinary storage medium, because it should be possible to encode DNA sequences, store the DNA, and then to retrieve the data which would be identified with a keyword, you could search for the keyword, adding a DNA strand whose sequence would stick to the keyword's DNA. So the search is performed completely in parallel, and that means that memories could not only be huge and inexpensive, if you could overcome the enormous problems to actually build something like this, but in fact they could be content addressable or associative, that is they would work in uh, much the same way that some people think our brains do. Uh, just to give you a feeling for the numbers here, if you um, had one pound of DNA molecules suspended in a cubic yard-sized tank, about a thousand quarts of fluid, you could create a memory bank that would have more storage capacity than all the memories of all the computers that have ever been made. Enormous obstacles to doing this. Accuracy is an issue. The DNA sequences usually do what they're supposed to do, but not all the time. In a PCR reaction, for example, the DNA makes a mistake in one out of 10,000 to one out of 100,000 molecules, and so we need to understand how to do error detection and correction, and what that means in this kind of a system, which has uh, such huge numbers of errors. The time is too long. You have to be a biologist to understand the steps. We need more rapid, much more automated processes. Uh, experts assure me that's coming, uh, and uh, they just neglected to say when. But I do want to point out that this is very similar to the ENIAC situation. Remember the room-sized computer with technicians and engineers who are manually transferring the results among the accumulators? Well, now we've replaced that with a room-sized computer, which has technicians and biologists manually transporting the intermediate results, except this time they're in test tubes and petri dishes. But just as with the ENIAC, we'd better not discount the possibility of a truly disruptive technology appearing in the next 50 years. I don't, and I think almost no one else believes, that this is the way to general purpose computing. But as machines solving certain problems or working in hybrids with electronic computing, it's hard to disregard the massive parallelism that this makes possible. We have a very long way to go. 50 years uh, seems a reasonable amount of time. But um, there are, as far as I can see, no basic physics limitations in sight. Now I'm going to have to speed up and talk a little bit uh, quickly about the last of the three alternatives, optical computing. This is not a new research area. People have been pursuing it for over 20 years. The appeal, of course, uh, for computing is that photons behave very differently from electrons. And their unique properties allow for fast communication and coherent interaction between the individual photons. Already, of course, it's uh, terrifically important. We've exploited these for communication, for data storage, audio CDs, video discs in the 1980s, the current IRDA infrared devices, the uh, fibers and lasers that are forming the backbone of the new information society. So interconnection networks at the heart of future electronic uh, computers almost certainly are going to be optical. But uh, what I'd like to explore is the question of an optical uh, computer and not its use as an interconnection device. Across the globe, researchers are pursuing different ways of implementing optical computing, but it's possible, I think, to group these activities into two categories, hybrid electronic optical computing and all optical computers. In the first of these, conventional electronic machines perform the general purpose computation, the control of resources. But the optical analog computers are included in the system to perform specialized functions. And these, of course, in exploit the key advantages of photons. Massive parallel interconnection, processing with high speed, and low power data transmission. So today, as an example of the kinds of things that people already are doing, let's discuss one such optical um, hybrid, the Fourier transform processor. Uh, many of these are in existence today. 
And since the Fourier transform is the heart of many optical computing approaches, uh, I thought you might uh, like to see how they work. Basically, a monochromatic laser light collimated into a parallel beam passes through a spatial light modulator driven by an electronic computer which presents the input image, here shown as the numeral three, to an optical system which creates, in parallel, at the speed of light, the Fourier transform of the image in both amplitude and phase. And this has to do with the very elegant characteristic of a lens to actually create the Fourier transform uh, if we choose the focal lens properly. Uh, this can be an extremely fast uh, processor, and in addition, the computation time for the optical processor is independent of the size of the input and output patterns, another one of those exponential advantages that we find so interesting. The second category is an all optical approach. Attempts to use only optical components to perform all of the functions of the computer right down to the transistor. Optical switching can occur at sub-picosecond rates, maybe a factor of a thousand times faster than the nanosecond times available with electronic switches. But to me, the all-optical computer seems very distant, uh, even though we're starting to see lasers appearing, which are fast enough to operate in this domain. There are a great many serious challenges. One of them, perhaps the most important one, is that um, we don't yet have a practical optical memory. We have delay lines and holographic stores, but in order to operate the way electronic computers do, and in order to avoid going back and forth in and out of electronic memories, we'll have to develop suitable electronic memories, figure out what optical VLSI looks like so we can get things short enough. And even if we're able to surmount those difficulties, um, we'll have to figure out uh, how we can program such machines, uh, the I.O. problems, all the rest of these that have to do with packaging. But if we could do it, what a wonderful technology for building neural computers, doing image processing, pattern recognition, and large-scale simulation. So I'd like to uh, conclude now. I presented these descriptions of three computing alternatives, uh, necessarily very superficially and incompletely. I apologize to any of the people here who've been working on them. I've certainly done them an injustice, but I want to add that these are not the only promising approaches. There are really quite a few others. What I w wanted to talk about was not so much these technologies, but I hope that I have created a reasonable doubt in all of your minds that 50 years from now, the world of computing is not going to simply consist of people using Decium Pros running Windows 47. Um, <laughs> I think there are a lot of obstacles to be overcome, but 50 years, especially with the World Wide Web and the emerging infrastructure at our disposal, is a very long time. So when I thought about these three, the conclusion I reach uh, is that in the future, we're going to communicate with photons, but we're going to compute with electrons. And the reason uh, I feel this way is because of the tremendous disparity in the coupling forces between charged particles and pro photons. It seems to me that computing, which involves changes of state and switching, is best done with strong forces, such as the Coulomb forces among electrons, and that just the opposite will continue to be true for communications in which the far weaker photon-to-photon -photon interactions uh, presents a decided advantage. So I think if I had to place a bet, I would bet on some form of quantum computing becoming uh, the way we keep the CMOS engine going, the widespread general purpose computing technology, whereas I think that optical and biological computing are likely to have important but more specialized functions, usually in hybrid systems. Of course, there's a sheep which is bleeding in Scotland today, which almost all of the researchers in the world uh, thought would be impossible. And so it may very well be that something new will come along that will make this prediction uh, quite uh, radical. I've gone quite over my time, but I just want to say a couple minutes more. Um, I'd like to ask your indulgence to spend a few moments speculating on some of the possible consequences of these unimaginably po powerful computers and vast memories. I'm going to follow my own prediction about not being too shy. I would like you to suspend your disbelief that some things, just for a few moments, you can go back as soon as we hold the paddles up, um, that things that we don't know today, like how to clone a sheep, my goodness, we even stuck electrical probes in it to replace the um, 
uh, heat of fertilization with electric current, Dr. Frankenstein would be so proud if he only knew <laughs> that that was how he had done it. Uh, but I'm thinking that over the next half century, we're going to know things that we don't know today. So for example, maybe in 50 years, we really will understand how the brain works. We'll map it. We'll understand the interconnection maps. We'll understand how our sensory organs are connected and how we really do this miracle of perception that Carver talked about. So the question uh, is, if you could imagine that we would learn those things, then would we have the computing power to build an auxiliary brain, perhaps a wearable one? A brain that could augment our abilities to reason, to remember, to communicate, the kinds of things that separate man from beasts. And then, in a related question, which I think the answer to that question is yes, could we use these computers to change the way we think about things in a dramatic way? For example, uh, many people have speculated uh, if such a device might have the capacity to store all of your life's experiences. That is, you'd wear a bunch of sensors, and whenever you turned them on, they would record your complete sensory experience. And I kind of like that idea because it would let you experience everything possible in, say, the first 40 years of your life, and then, like a romantic poet, spend the rest of it sitting around just reliving all those things that you <laughs> had done when you were young enough to do it. Um, <laughs> But um, imagine also that we learn a lot about language and speech recognition and that it has some commensurate breakthroughs. And why wouldn't it be possible to have a brain which could also do language translation, perhaps in real time? And in fact, let's stretch credulity to the absolute limit. Let's say that this knowledge of how the brain works and our ability to map individual brains brings us to the point that we can understand what distinguishes one person's brain or sensory apparatus from another. Well, then we might be able to create a transfer function, I have a feeling this will take more than 50 years, which would map the characteristics of one brain onto another so that when you went to the opera, you would hear it through the ears of the diva. When you went and sampled wine, it would be the sommelier's taste buds that would create your experience. So I think we're gonna know a lot more about how our bodies work, about how our emotions work. Could we make a computer with a sense of humor, for example? How we would build such a machine. And um, while we have essentially no understanding of how to communicate with it, today's um, superconducting quantum interference devices, squids, are already sensitive enough to easily detect the changes in magnetic field that are smaller than, in fact, the brain waves. So even something that far-fetched doesn't violate physical principles. Let me conclude by uh, paraphrasing something that George Bernard Shaw once said. He said that the reasonable man seeks to understand the world, and then he adapts to it. The unreasonable man seeks to understand himself and try to change the world so that it would match what he wanted it to be. All progress depends upon unreasonable men. And I hope that uh, some of you will be provoked in these next two and a half days to leave here and start thinking quite unreasonably about it. Because I think that the underlying question behind this conference, and in fact, behind all the talks that you're going to hear, is this one. And I hope you'll keep it in mind as you listen. What will it be like to be a human in the year 2047? Thank you.